Hello class. This lesson is a continuation in a series of lessons on stoichiometry. In the previous lesson, we conceptually covered the idea of limiting reactant using particle diagrams. And in this lesson, we're going to learn how to calculate and solve limiting reactant problems. Limiting reactants, as we mentioned in the last lesson, uh, are the reactants that run out first during the course of the reaction. Since they run out first, they limit the amount of products formed. If you are given two starting amounts of reactants in your problem, this means it is a limiting reactant problem, and you're going to have to use one of these two methods to solve. I'm going to go over an example of both methods today. Uh, the first method requires us to set up two gram-to-gram -gram conversions. Essentially, what we're doing is converting grams of reactant A all the way to grams of product C. And we would also convert grams of reactant B all the way to grams of product C. Once we have our answers for both conversions, we're going to compare them. The smaller amount of product C produced is the true amount that is produced. The reactant that produced that smaller amount is the limiting reactant. So for instance, if I produced 1.5 grams of product C from reactant A and 0.75 grams of product C from reactant B, reactant B would be the limiting reactant because it produced a smaller amount. Essentially what we were doing with each of these conversions is assuming that one of the reactants, the one that we have a value for, is limiting and the other reactant is completely in excess. And we are saying, what happens if we convert all of this limiting reactant to products? And then we'll compare them. As we do a calculation, you'll see this in practice and it'll make a little bit more sense as we go. With method two, we have something called a before change and after table. Uh, this is particularly great if you have a question that asks you to find more than that, more than just the mass of one particular product. So a question might be phrased in such a way that says, what is the mass of product C produced? What is the mass of product D produced? How much of reactant B is left over? That kind of thing. A BCA table is great for finding multiple quantities and still performing stoichiometry in a more efficient way. The before row is all of the given quantities, and you want to make sure that they are converted to moles. The change row is based off of the coefficients and the rate of consumption or the rate of reactions. So if I have, for instance, a coefficient of 1 for reactant A and a coefficient of 2 for reactant B, reactant B is going to be consumed more quickly because we consume 2 moles for every 1 mole of reactant A. So we're going to use that to help us identify which runs out first. The after row requires us to just subtract the change from the before row in order to get the excess moles of reactant and the moles of products formed. So let's do an example. This first one, we're only going to use method one. It says nitrogen gas can be prepared from passing solid ammonia uh, or, sorry, passing gaseous ammonia over solid copper 2 oxide at high temperatures. The other products of the reaction are copper and water vapor. If a sample containing 18.1 grams of ammonia is reacted with 90.4 grams of uh, copper 2 oxide, which is the limiting reactant and how many grams of N2 will be formed? So first we need uh, to write our balanced equation. So here we've got and H3, we're told it's a gas, and it reacts with solid copper oxide. And we're told it produces N2 gas, as well as solid copper and water vapor, which is water in the gas form. And that is a G, sorry about that. Okay, let's go through and balance. I have 2n on the right and only 1 on the left, so I will need to double that. This gives me 6 hydrogen on the left and only 2 on the right, so I need 
to add a 3 there. 3 times 2 is 6. That also gives me 3 oxygen on the right, but only 1 on the left. So I need a 3 here. And then my final, I've got 3 copper on the left now, and I need 3 copper on the right. And I end up with a balance of 2, 3, 1, 3, 3. All right, so let's identify what we're given. We're given our mass of one of our reactants, NH3, and our mass of our other reactant, CuO. And then we want to know how many grams of N2 are formed. So let's set up our first gram and mole conversion. 18.1 grams of NH3. All right. And I will convert that to moles. So we always do gram to mole, mole to mole, mole back to mass. Um, so we'll put in our molar masses of ammonia here. And again, you can use your periodic table to calculate that. 14.01 um, plus 3.03 .03 from your hydrogens gets you 17.04. Then with this one, I need my mole from my known, which is ammonia, and then my moles of N2 up top, and then moles of N2 to grams of N2. So 14.01 times 2 is 28.02 grams of N2. And if we check our units here, grams of NH3 cancel, mole of NH3 cancels, moles of N2 cancels, our final answer will be in grams of N2. That's the setup for the first one. Let's go ahead and set up the second calculation. We've got 90.4 grams of CuO. Same setup, mole, gram to mole of each. Um, let's see, the molar mass of copper, I think, is 63 point, 63.55. Sorry, it was hard to read through all of that. 63.55 plus 16 for oxygen. So we get... 79.55 grams of CuO. And we've got three moles of CuO for every one mole of N2. Now, based off of the mole ratio, we are going to use more moles of CuO uh, compared to moles of NH3 during the course of this reaction. But it is important to note that the starting amounts are not always going to be the same amount of moles. 18.1 uh, divided by 17.4 is roughly one mole, um, whereas uh, 90.4 divided by 79.5 is more like 1.3 or 1.4 moles. So we're just going to have to keep in mind that the, the rates of consumption here are, are different, but also the starting amounts of moles are different, so that can affect our overall yield. And I'm still converting to grams of N2 here because I want to compare these answers when I'm done. So let's go into our calculator. Uh, keep in mind that each of these uh, starting values are three significant figures. So our final answer should be in three significant figures. So I'm going to divide by 17.04. I'm going to divide by two because it's one mole over two moles. That's one half. And then I'm going to multiply by 28.02. And I get 14.9 grams for my first 14.9 grams of N2 formed. And then let's go through and do the second calculation. 90.4 divided by 79.55 divided by 3 times 28.02. All right. And then this one forms. Oh, what happened here? This one forms 10.6, 10.6 grams of N2. All right, so just like I said before, we're going to compare our final two values. This is the smaller amount produced of N2, which means this is the true amount. So 10.6 grams of N2 is produced. And since that's the smaller amount, that means that CuO runs out first. CuO is the limiting reactant. So in this particular situation, 
this does match the mole ratio that we had of three to two. We see that the rate of consumption of uh, CUO uh, is greater because we're consuming three moles for every two moles. Um, but even the starting amount that we have is not enough to, to overcome that. So this is still the limiting reactant here. Okay, so go ahead and use this same method for you try it set 12. Uh, for you try it set 12, uh, just come up with two sets of gram to gram conversions for each and then convert to uh, the mass of product that they ask for. Okay, so now we're going to move on to an example dealing with a BCA table. Uh, you'll see in this particular question, we have 2 grams of zinc metal uh, and 2.50 grams of silver nitrate as our reactants. And when they react, they form 2 moles of silver and 1 mole of zinc nitrate. This particular question asks a lot of you because it asks, first, what reactant is limiting? Two, how many grams of silver is formed? how many grams of zinc nitrate is formed, and how many grams of excess reactant are left at the end of the reaction. So before we can get started, um, one thing with BCA tables, as I mentioned before, is that all of the values for a BCA table need to be in moles. So we need to find the molar masses of our objects, of our reactants and products, and then convert the given quantities to moles. Uh, so, First things first, we're going to need the molar mass of zinc, which is 65.38, and silver, which is 107.87. So I'm actually going to scroll up because I can run out of space doing these sometimes. So uh, my zinc, I said, is 65.38, and that's uh, grams per mole. Silver is 107.87 grams per mole. And ignore the fact that there's two moles of it in the balance equation. We'll come to that part a little bit later. I need to calculate my molar mass for my other components. So I've got 107.87 plus 14.01 plus 16 times 3 for my silver nitrate. And I get a molar mass of 169. Oops. My handwriting is a little atrocious here. Let's try that again. So I had 65.38 grams per mole for zinc. I have 169.88 grams per mole for silver nitrate. I've got 107.87 grams per mole for silver. And then for zinc, I've got a, uh, the zinc nitrate. I've got 65.38 plus 14.01 times 2 because of the 2 on the outside of the parentheses plus 16, which is oxygen. There's three of them on the inside, times two on the outside, three times two is six. So I end up with uh, 189 point, oops, 189.4 grams per mole here. Now those molar masses are gonna be important at, when I go through and solve the um, rest of the problems. So let's get our before row taken care of. The nice thing is that we're only given reactants here, so we can make the assumption that there are zero moles of products to start our reaction. The 2 grams of zinc and the 2.5 grams of silver nitrate we need to convert to moles, so we can set up our dimensional analysis and um, divide by our molar masses. So uh, 2.0 divided by 65.38. And I'm not going to round for sig figs yet. I'll save that for the end of the problem. But I've got 0 0.03059 uh, moles here. Um, so 0 0.03059 moles. And then for silver, I've got 2.50 divided by 169.88. All right. And that gives us 0 0.0147, uh, let's say 2 moles here, 0 0.01472 moles. Okay, so now we have to compare the amounts that we're starting with. Uh, in the course of the reaction, one mole of zinc is used, so the change for that I'm going to put in the corner here is minus x because we're going to use 
some molar amount X every time the reaction repeats. For silver nitrate, it's going to be 2x based off of the coefficient, so minus 2x because I'm going to use up twice as much as uh, the zinc in the course of the reaction. As a result of using those amounts, I'm going to produce, so plus 2x for silver and plus x, plus 1x for zinc. Now, those numbers in front of the x, again, are coming from your balanced equation, so the 1, 2, 2, and 1. Now, let's do some assumptions here. If I use all of my zinc, let's assume zinc is limiting for a minute. If I use all of my zinc, and that is the limiting reactant, and this goes down to zero, that means my x has to be the same amount as I started with, 0 0.03059. If I subtract 0 0.03059 from the starting amount of silver nitrate, will I have a positive number? The answer is no, I would have a negative number. So therefore, just based off of that simple step alone, zinc cannot be the limiting reactant based off of the starting amounts that we have. Let's try it again now, assuming that silver nitrate's the limiting reactant. But again, if, we're, if it's the limiting reactant, that means we're going to use all of it. So if we use all of our 0 0.01472 moles, and we subtract that from the 0 0.0359, will we have any left over? Yes, we will. So what we're going to do is do exactly that and set up our subtraction step. So I'm going to assume that all of my silver nitrate is going to get used, which means I'm going to subtract 0.1472 moles from here to get down to zero. Now, because my change is 2x, I'm actually going to have to figure out what x is, but I can fill in the other parts of the table that are easy for right now. If I'm subtracting 0.01472 moles of silver nitrate, I can add that same amount to my product side because that will be the same amount of silver that is formed. So in the end, I end up with 0 0.01472 moles of silver. Now for x, if I have 0 0.01472, if I divide that by 2, I can figure out my x value, because 2x is equal to 0 0.01472. So I get this small value, which means that is what I'm subtracting as x. So minus 0, 0, 0,007358 moles. And then that's what I'm adding over here for my zinc, 0, 0, 0,007358 moles. So if I'm adding that amount, 0, 0.007358 moles. And then I have to go back and do my subtraction step. So 0 0.03059 minus my answer. And there's some degree of error here because I had some rounding and, and I understand that, but it's as close as we're going to get. That's why we still take into account sig figs at the end. I have 0 0.232 moles left over. Okay. So I have my excess, I have my amount of moles of silver form and my moles of zinc formed, and uh, silver nitrate is my limiting reactant. The question did ask for grams, so that's where those molar masses come back in. We just need to multiply our molar masses by our moles that we have determined with our table. So I'm going to multiply times 65.38 grams. And for three sig figs, 1.52 grams of zinc in excess. We can say silver nitrate is limiting. So we got 1.52 grams in excess. Silver nitrate is limiting. We'll go back 0 0.0147. Uh, I'll just put in the whole decimal. I know I've gotten a little sloppy with my numbers here, but that's okay. 
again, with sig figs, we should be all right. 107 times 0.87. So I multiply by that, I get 1.59 uh, grams of silver produced. And then I do the same thing for my last one. Uh, 189.4 is my molar mass of zinc times 0 0.007358, whatever that was. And I get one, oops. And I get 1.39 grams of zinc nitrate produced. I'm running out of space here, produced. All right. So using that table is a good way to come up with all the quality, uh, all the quantities and do multiple, uh, essentially, gram and mole conversions at once is what we've been able to do um, by using this table. Uh, let's go ahead and try one on your own. So I put a table set up already for you in this particular one, and I balanced it for you. Um, but go ahead and set up your table for this problem. OK. The last thing we need to talk about here is theoretical yield and actual yield. Uh, these are two ideas that will come into play when we are doing labs because the actual yield is the amount of product collected and labbed, and that's what's realistic and what is measured. The theoretical yield is the amount of product formed when a limiting reactant is completely consumed. Theoretical yield is always a calculated amount, and this assumes perfect lab conditions and gives the maximum possible amount. Uh, you're never going to match your theoretical yield, barring some extraordinary miracles. It is okay to have a theoretical, or sorry, a theoretical yield not match your actual yield. And for that reason, we always calculate percent yield in lab when there's some sort of product we have to recover. This is the ratio of the actual to the theoretical yield. Uh, it's not the same as percent error. Percent error is actual minus theoretical over theoretical times 100. That tells you how far off your value is compared to what a true value should be. So percent error is more for dealing with accuracy and precision, whereas percent yield is more just how well did you perform the lab and what were you able to recover. Uh, so the exercise I have here um, says methyl alcohol, uh, can be manufactured by combination of carbon monoxide and hydrogen gas. Uh, and we want to calculate the theoretical yield. They tell us three values here. They give us 68.5 kilograms of carbon monoxide. They give us 8.60 grams uh, or kilograms of H2. Um, and then they tell us how much is produced. Now, actually produced, that is our actual yield. We do not use that in any calculations till the end of the problem. But the other two values that were given, we have two reactants. So this is still a limiting reactant problem. OK. Um, CO and H2 form methyl alcohol. OK, and we have to balance real quick. Uh, it looks like. I have to double this, and that's it, because I've got four H's. So, yeah. All right, so we want to figure out how much is produced. 65 uh, kilograms of CO. And i got to convert this to grams first, um, because kilograms is not going to be very useful when I'm using my molar masses. So then now I can do my gram and mole conversion. Um, 12.01 plus 16 tells me the molar mass is 28.01 grams of CO for every one mole of CO. I have to use my mole ratio, one mole of CH3OH over every one mole of CO. And then I need to convert back to grams, just like I've been doing. Um, 
So 1.01 times 4 for my four hydrogens plus 12.01 plus 16. Uh, the mass of methanol is 32.05 grams per mole. Oops, just grams. Um, so 68.5 times 1,000 divided by 28.01 times 1 over 1, which I will leave it off here, but times 32.05. And I get, uh, let's see, to three sig figs, uh, 7.84 times 10 to the fourth uh, grams. Here we go. 7.84 times 10 to the fourth grams of methanol produced there. If I've got 8.60 kilograms of H2, I'm going to do the same business, convert to grams first. One mole of H2 is the same as 2.02 grams of H2. But this time, my mole ratio is two moles of H2 from the balance equation, one mole of CH3OH. And then I still use the same molar mass here, 32.05. All right, and then let's calculate 8.60 times 1,000 divided by 2.02 uh, divided by 2 this time, because 1 over 2, and then times 32.05. All right, and this is 6.82 times 10 to the fourth grams. So hydrogen is our limiting reactant here because that produces the smaller amount. And this is our theoretical, 6.82 times 10 to the fourth. So this is our theoretical yield. The last part of this question is just the percent yield, which is 3.57 times 10 to the fourth is my actual over my theoretical 6.82 times 10 to the fourth. Uh, and then I am going to multiply this by 100 to get my percentage. Uh, and notice I rounded my numbers to three sig figs just for sanity's sake. So times 10 to the fourth divided by 6.82 times 10 to the fourth, close parentheses, times 100. The percent yield for this reaction is 52.35%. Okay. So always do actual over theoretical. This one still ended up being a limiting reactant problem, so the method of solving is the same. But keep an eye out for something that is actually produced. You're going to use that at the end of your reaction. Okay, and that is the end of this lesson sequence. Go ahead and try this last one on your own. Our next topic uh, will deal with uh, types of chemical reactions and solution chemistry. See you in the next one.